welcome back to another episode of the animated series where we interview the dopest talents and get all the untold stories by people working in the animation industry. I'm here with our terrific guests, Jay Hasrajani and Jay Cool. Hey. Could you tell me a little bit about yourselves and where you're from and if that's inspired any of your storytelling so far? I think I was just an incredibly weird theater kid. I have two aunts that have been on Broadway and one uncle that's been on Broadway. What? And like, so like a lot of theater was always very part of everything. My family crest, our like motto is don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Right? So like, we're always very, very big, like, I don't know, we like to put on a show. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of like where I kind of really started. I didn't really start writing uh, until I was in college. Uh, then I like, I started just submitting headlines to The Onion, working my way through there. Two weeks after graduation, I moved out to Los Angeles with like nothing, but I wanted to work in animation. That was what had inspired me through like everything. And uh, it took me a few years just to even get like that first like foot in the door. I kind of just kind of kept on going. I worked in animation production for the first five or eight years of my career. And around 2015, I got headhunted over to Cartoon Network. And on my first day, the only other person in orientation uh, with me was uh, Jay. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we jump into that, how did you get to that point where you met Jake? My parents are um, Indian, and uh, they were born in India. So I always, like even now, thinking back, I'm like, man, uh, growing up was just a whole bunch of confusion. <laughs> like, how do you do things as, you know, there's no like blue book for like, hey, this is how you be an American little kid, mm -hmm. you know? I think uh, usually when people are in that situation, art is such a great way to express yourself, mm -hmm. um, your confusion, or even just a place to go to that it, where everyone knows and understands you because it's yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I was always into drawing. The first thing I drew were, was Wolverine. Wait, your first drawing ever was, you went for one of the hardest characters to draw <laughs> Look, at first? A short, hairy <laughs> superhero? <laughs> Count me in, I am there. Wait, 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 was this just like normal Wolverine with like a tank top and the jeans or was this like his full yellow and black X-Men suit? I mean, you know, like- Or did you do the dual like brown. beige tan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Way uh, easier. Okay. I mean, I did Less both. I did early. both. I loved Wolverine. Um, and, you know, actually, uh, segueing from that, comics was a really good... Even my dad loved comics. Mm -hmm. It was an art form that he was collecting. And when I would go to comic book stores with him, and, you know, he's Indian-born. Uh, mm -hmm. And his way into America was through, like... Uh, disco, metal, and comics. So what? that was kind of like my bedrock was like, oh, the American stuff is disco, metal, and comics. Obviously, uh. that's what all <laughs> Americans like. And then the other stuff is like Bollywood music and long, you know, uh, Indian, Hindi poetry and all that stuff. So I, so I drew a lot. And uh, me and my friends growing up in uh, a suburb in California, I would steal my dad's camcorder and oh. we'd make short films and like you know we just taught ourselves it was a suburb it was boring yeah we just uh cruised around the hills and filmed <laughs> stuff and drew i didn't know animation was like a viable career option mm. and when i did I, I just fell in love with it i went to uh san jose state um and got my uh bfa in animation illustration mm. and just hustled uh in la uh, working non-union jobs, doing the whole indie animation circuit. Yeah. Then I got my first union gig on uh, the Powerpuff Girls, and that's where I met that guy. Oh, snap. How did you guys kind of find each other from oh. then? Because oh. there's a lot of other people who work on these shows. How yeah. How did you two find each other specifically? I was brought in for kind of like, um, just a general like one day room. We oh. were like pitching out like a whole bunch of ideas. And then based on that, uh, the showrunners were like, oh yeah, well, we want to give you a script. Yeah. And I distinctly recall it was like over New Year's Eve uh, that I was like staying up and trying to finish and write it. And I like, I put every like bit together and I genuinely didn't really think 
that they were gonna go for it. And then on my first day, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. well, we're putting that one right into production. That's gonna be number three in the episode order. And uh, this is guy who's gonna storyboard it. <laughs> and so it was literally uh, handed to Jay on his first day. And then it was like, all right, well, you guys are gonna work together now. For those of you back home in animation, there are two types of shows. There is a board-driven show, which typically means that the storyboard artists are usually getting handed an outline versus a script-driven show, which is typically, you know, a writer's going in, writing a full script based off of the outline that they've come up with within the room, and then giving that to the board artist to then draw. So was, was Powerpuff Girls board-driven or script-driven? Powerpuff Girls was board-driven, but what was unlike any other driven show that I've ever really been a part of. The two showrunners were like, we know our way around a script, but mm. we're not really experts in it. Yeah. So they had myself and Haley Mancini, the uh, other staffed writer on the show, they were like, you guys want to be very, very active in the storyboard process. So we essentially, it's like we would put together an incredibly stepped through outline that had dialogue. It was more than just a premise, it was like, pretty detailed and intense. Mm. Then it would go over to the board teams where it'd be like, all right, you're gonna plus this, encourage it, restage this, reset it, and if you have any problems, you don't need to come up with this on your own. Jake and Haley are just right down the hall. So at any time that like Jay was like, I need to restage this thing, this joke isn't gonna work, he didn't have to tear out his head trying to solve it on his own. Mm. He could bring me in and then we could like bat it around until we found something that sort of like worked. I really got a sense from Jake and Haley that they were collaborators and that they wanted to work as a team. Mm -hmm. And it was just something I didn't want to take for granted because, you know, as a board artist in a board driven show, you are doing some writing and you are gonna throw stuff at the wall to see if it sticks. And it's always great to have a writer that has your back that can sharpen your skills, that can sharpen your joke telling. There's a lot of ways to learn from each other on like, okay, when you stage, we gotta stage this way. So a board artist may be like, this is the most beneficial way to stage this. And the writer is like, I see what you're doing. This is the best way to get that story across, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. and then it, it like, we toss the ball all the time. I think like the most dangerous words in animation, and you'll hear people who have not worked in animation say this all the time, especially writers who have never worked in animation. I I know what you're gonna say. They will say, I love animation because you can do anything. anything. <laughs> right? No. And the moment that they say that, I go, all right, you have no concept of it. What you're saying in your brain is, I can write whatever I want and someone else is gonna figure out how this is gonna be producible. Yeah. In live action, if Meryl Streep walks in here, there is one person that makes Meryl Streep physically Meryl Streep and makes her sound like Meryl Streep. But for animation, the mere things of just like Meryl Streep walking in and it's like, how is she draw how is she designed? How is she dressed? What is she interacting with props? Where does she move? Where's her eye line? How does she sound like? What does the mouth sing? That is so many artistic disciplines coming together to make just one person that in live action they just are. Yeah. When you break down the doors on all of these other disciplines and allow writers to see what designers are doing, to see what production is doing, to see how everything is organized with awesome production teams, to see how board artists write, uh, work with uh, designers and everything else, then you get a super team. And we kind of like calling it a selfless creator instead of a selfish creator, mm. right? So like... Yeah. If I'm a board artist and I'm like, man, I'm gonna fully animate this shot and have crazy camera turns and all of this stuff, then there's gonna be someone down the line that's like, oh, we don't have the budget for this, we can't mm -hmm. do this, we can't do that. You guys know kind of like how your hard work can kind of build up to great opportunities and space for diversity. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about how you were trying to achieve that goal with Boons and Curses? Boons and Curses, um, was the first um, South Asian inspired and uh, featuring uh, action adventure fantasy show. And it was uh, our kind of vessel to 
not only highlight diversity in front of the screen, featuring an all South Asian voice cast and all South Asian and beautiful brown characters, but also diversity behind the screen. Age, gender, race, diversity. And we really wanted to build a team that sets each other up for success of the future. So we pair veterans in, in, in the industry with people who are newcomers, because we also believe that in order to make uh, entertainment more diverse, you have to set up uh, people who have not had a fair chance for success. You have to ha make something, make this uh, have as much equity as possible. You cannot uh, just sit back. You have to actually fight for diversity at every step, and you have to be very, very loud about it. And you have to go, give me another, give me another round. I'm not seeing enough in here. You have to ask for it because, and it does not matter the makeup of the person across the table from you. They are like just going to try to give you the stuff that they've already known, mm -hmm. right? And if the past is prologue, it's very whitewashed. Yeah. So you need to really, you have to always be at the forefront and very, very active about it. And two, when you look at somebody's work, you need to tell them why you believe in them. Because sometimes you come across people and they are not fully ready to believe in themselves at the level yet. For our writer's room, um, we were bringing on one of, uh, at the time Netflix had an apprenticeship program. Yeah. And so we said that we wanted all the author's names taken off every project. We wanted to read it just on the scripts alone. And that was it. We're like, we'll do it. Like, And we're like, this is the genre of the show. Bring us scripts that you think would fit that genre. The last one that we read was, to this day, I think one of the best pilots that we had ever read. And we're like, call in this person, and that was Shayna, uh, who is happens to also be South Asian. And Shayna thought when she was coming into the meeting that she was getting called into the Boons and Curses room because she was South Asian. And we literally, at the, at the start of the meeting, were like, we're only here to talk about your script. And if you want to bring that talent to us, we would love to have it. Because a lot of times people assume I must be in here because of who I am and not just the quality of my work. Yeah. So a lot of times when we're in there, we're like, we believe in this work. You might just need the opportunity and we want to help you get it. All of that stuff is in consideration when building a team, but really front of mind was like, how can we highlight underrepresentation as much as possible. Yeah. And so again, kind of uh, quoting Everett here, like how can we create a space that they feel safe to thrive in? And we give them the freedom to flourish. Going back even a little bit further, right before you pitched Boons, I do recall us just kind of talking to me like, I don't know, we need to really bet on ourselves and bet on really the stories that are passionate. Stop trying to chase what we thought everyone would like, right? Mm -hmm. What can we do and what can we bring to the table? Jay did not think at the time that Boons and Curses was even going to get its foot in the door. Mm -hmm. He thought that this was going to be like show number four. Like when he's like, I've now done your, what you asked me to do and now I finally earned up enough cred that you're gonna let me tell this fantasy epic we're like, let's flash forward, pretend it's 10 years in the future. Yeah. And there you are, and you're at Comic-Con, and there's a big panel in Hall H, and everyone goes, Mr. Hazard Johnny, how, how did you, how did this come about? Tell us, like, how this went. And you just go, well, I don't know, I had a dream, and it's something that I always wanted, and they took a shot on me, and it paid off. Mm. And then I'm like, that is every goddamn Comic-Con panel in all of history. Yep. It's everybody's story. Yep. So why not you? Jay 100% dug into what his voice as an artist is and the things that make Jay Hazrajani the Jay Hazrajani. And that is what he brought to Boons and Curses and to honestly all the projects that we've done since and the ones that we were doing before. For those of you who don't know, in Boons and Curses, your crew members, they sung your praises. The whole team was so um, incredible. I mean, I think that's something that 
that's a heartache we're still we still deal with every yeah. day. I mean, it's been a while now. So whenever we see them succeed, whenever we see them in in public, we're just like, oh my god, you you guys yeah, are. Yeah. We 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 love the team. You know, look, uh, getting uh, uh, canceled in a studio is not fun. Yeah. Right. There's no way to sugarcoat that. You know, we had so many beautiful, like, diverse people in that room, and seeing people like crying and it's the first time they're seeing they had a hand in like debuting their own culture yeah. like and then that's taken away and who knows how many years were set back from that being realized right oh, it's a it's a big yeah. blow right so yeah. we even saw some of the uh uh executives that were had told us the news they were tearing up in that room mm -hmm. you know we had a lot of love on that show and i will do anything in my power to get it back yeah. in that kind of room, that team, I, yeah. working on something that's special again. We can all agree, the three of us, that animation is indeed a freaking medium and not a genre as they would like to push so often. Is there any piece of animation or just media in general that you think kind of represents like that idea for you or that you haven't seen that you want to create? There's a lot of sort of facets to that question. I believe that every person, regardless of if you are a creative or not, you're just human and storytelling is very like part of everything. But at the core of it, we're always wrestling with an existential question in the back of our mind. And this existential question shifts as our experience and our life shifts and the stories that we're drawn to uh, are always echoing into that existential question. Yeah. There are people who go, I like to work in this specific genre, and usually that genre is deals with an existential question that is very front of their mind. If all that I ever did were Westerns, I would probably think about them and I was like, yeah, what is really that existential thought of the Western? It is a solo person who goes out and like solves everything by himself with guns and a horse, <laughs> right? But that's not really what I'm kind of really more drawn to. I tend to really like uh, broken systems mm. and systems that break in ways that were not originally intended because usually that's how a lot of things like break mm. you know I tend to really like stuff that's farcical in that way oh, okay so like something you know I think that Brazil kind of hits the note really well the one of the first things that we ever bonded over was Metal Gear Solid Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize that you could do that with characters. I didn't realize you could do that Throw with... Throw a cardboard box over them. <laughs> well, it was like, this is an action thing, but we're not going to shoot our way out of it. In yeah. fact, if you try to shoot your way out of it, you're going to lose, gonna shoot, yeah. right? This is a thing of patience, and you can see it reflected in kind of the story, right? The entire core of Metal Gear Solid is about this... He was a hero and everyone imagines him as going in and guns blazing. And he's like, I don't want to do that. Uh, it's not what I do. None of that works. And everybody else around him, every other character is idealistic about the natures of war and battle and politics. And when I say idealistic, I don't always mean good. Sometimes yeah. they're like, this is the way of the world. This is how it's going to be. And it only ends in death and destruction, mm -hmm. right? And they're always thrown off by a system that is breaking around them. Be it a ghost in the machine that kind of throws them off, or it's even their own bodies that they're like, you are part of a super soldier program, but unfortunately you're made to die. <laughs> like everything just doesn't quite work the way that it's supposed to. So I know that's a very long-winded way of sort of saying what genre that I would kind of want to work in. It's perfect. Um, so I guess the genre I would probably say, yeah, is cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I love how you yeah. didn't even say western. You just no, said cowboy. No, just straight cowboy. I want chaps. <laughs> I, I think, uh, uh, okay, so like, have I seen a lot of media that represents me? Recently, yes. You know, shrug. In animation, no. It's hard to answer, right? Because... You know, aside from, you know, Sanjay Patel made this short called Sanjay's Super Team, mm -hmm. which I saw myself in, 
right? It's this short that's beautiful. Everyone should go watch it. It's about this little, you know, uh, brown kid. And I was like, I've been there. I've seen that. But here's the funny thing. I haven't grown up with myself being reflected in media. Yeah. So when I first saw Sanjay's Super Team, it's like, oh my God, first it's brown rendered CG animation skin. Oh my God, right? What? That's how that looks like? I didn't know that. And when I saw that, I felt uncomfortable. I was like, oh my God, it's some, it, I felt like I was naked in that theater. It's like really? someone has seen me. Until today, I still fight back that feeling. When I see a brown character on screen, I'm like, okay, it's fine. Uh, they, they're seeing you, but it's okay. You're seeing you. Is that okay? What is that? How much, you know, and then you have all these questions. Like, am I allowed to be okay with am this? Am I? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. So what I'm attracted into making is projects that highlight brown people, you know? And I think it's a super exciting, it's super inspiring. I think there's a well, uh, for example, uh, in video games and in media, we see so much like World War II and World War I content, especially World War II. Oh man, yeah. A lot, right? A like, lot. Like it, this video game is revamped every time. Mm -hmm. And it's only until recently have we seen the South Asian influence on those wars, oh. which is a huge part of those wars, right? You know, even just taking that that genre alone, like, have we seen that World War II Indian-led film? Mm -mm. No, we haven't, but we've seen so many others, right? Yeah. That's something that's, that I'm drawn to. Um, yeah, it's cowboy genre. Cowboy, <laughs> cowboy, cowboy. cowboy, cowboy. cowboy. Yeah. How has the industry changed since even around like 2008? First of all, like management structures, I think people are waking up to like how they should be treated and having more self-respect. Yes. And I think we should uh, lean more towards that and have more sane productions using a common sense. Yeah. It's something on Boons that we used to say a lot was, we're gonna have the common sense revolution. It's like, oh, you need a break? Take a break. Yeah, <laughs> It's not hard, you know? It's not like we have to do backflips and yeah. like go through like the craziest hoops. In animation, the whole uh, work from home subject is very controversial. Oh yeah. yeah. And I will say things to consider regarding working from home or not is, diversity, mm -hmm. right? So we have diverse individuals who are entering the workplace. Where is the person showing them the ropes? Mm -hmm. Is there no person? They're just in their apartment, uh, you know, just trying to figure yeah. it out. And then the other thing is like passive, I, I like to call it passive mentorship. So if I'm in, uh, it's lunchtime and, you know, Netflix had a cafe, but if we're going out to lunch, I can ask another veteran showrunner, hey, can we grab lunch? I have these issues with production. Can you help me with that? Or even just bumping to them in the hallway. Yeah. Hey, um, this is what happened. How was your experience? Like the amount of knowledge I've gained throughout my career just by being able to do that saved my uh, life not being anywhere close to this industry, right? Yeah. And understanding how to work in a studio. Right? Yeah. But I also don't think people should sacrifice their whole livelihood yeah. just to be able to draw a background, yeah. right? They need yeah. to go to their doctor's appointments, get groceries, mm -hmm. tend to their loved ones. During COVID, the people on our crew that honestly had the most hardships were the people who should have the least hardships. They were the people who were just starting out, who were just coming up. What am I supposed to say to my 22-year-old PA who doesn't have an apartment that has enough office space for him and his three roommates, Yeah. right? And he has to work on his own bed. And we're like, this is great. Let's not give him any help, mm -hmm. right? I was like, this is genuinely physically cruel. Yeah. So it's really, again, it's just like going to everyone in your crew going, what are your needs? Yeah. What do you need to do your job? Because I need you to do this job and I want you to be good at it. Because yeah. if you're good at it, then I get to go home and sleep as opposed to stress about how everything's falling apart. We've talked about the booms. We've talked about the curses. Give me a little bit of those Garfield stories now. <laughs> what Look, does that mean? Garfield's the patron saint of <laughs> Mondays. animation, I think. Mondays. I, okay, here's the thing. At the end of the day, we can be very incredibly dramatic about all the stuff, but if it's not fun to make things, then it's not going to be fun, of right? Course. This is 
cartoons. It's animation. They're delightful. It's not like the most serious thing in the world. Yeah. And for us, we found that the best way to express that, especially with executives, the more <laughs> stuffed shirt that they are, the better. We will respond to their things with just Garfields. Pictures of Garfields, images of Garfields, and then it's usually put in this way where we would be like, both of us would send a quick Garfield like emoji, and then I'd be like, oh my God, a double field. <laughs> you gotta, and then, what a momentous occasion. Every And uh, yeah, I mean, look, we love goofing around yeah. on set, uh, uh, on uh, behind the scenes. We love inside jokes with the crew and like spreading it and making it weird. Like we have all these stories on, on Boone's we used to call uh, people silly willies, you know, in the crew, and then that evolved to Sillium Williams until with uh, Ian, uh, one of our directors, Hainbottom, uh, we did uh, Silheim Wilhelms, <laughs> and we just keep on going because it just at expands the end of the day, and expands. We're all yes. Silheim Wilhelms. But yeah, you know, when we were at Cartoon Network, there was no shortage of people who wanted to be very serious about it at all times. Of course. Uh, and we love both fun and we also love petty larceny. <laughs> so one morning, and this happened to be uh, around April 1st, um, we basically got to the office early. We broke into um, other shows' offices and we stole, like every show would always have like props and poster cutouts and everything like that. I forgot where we started. We start with Adventure Time. I think so. I think, yeah, I think we started, I think Adventure Time had a, like, giant Jake the dog. <laughs> and the Powerpuff Girls floor had a uh, crane machine, like you would play in an arcade. Um, so we picked the lock to that, and we put the Adventure <laughs> Time dog inside the crane machine, then locked it. And then we proceeded to send ransom notes to <laughs> Adventure Time and told them they could only free uh, Jake the dog if they stole something from Steven Universe that we asked for. Ooh. So then they did, and then we had what Steven Universe had, and then we would repeat it with the next show. What did they steal from Steven? So at the time, Cartoon <laughs> Network would celebrate your green light by making a pinata of your character, mm. because if there's one thing that really separates the li like celebrates the life of a character, it's <laughs> hitting them with a bat. <laughs> Is that why they switched to giving people bikes? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. They, they gave oh, it. They, yeah. So Cartoon Network at one point, fun fact, Cartoon Network, when you would get your show greenlit, yes, they would give you yeah. a pinata. But then at one point around like the, it had to be the Craig era because I remember Ben and Matt, I think have a, had a bike in their office for such a long time but they would give you a bike. It would just be a bike, just a regular bike. There's nothing really that crazy. It just said, it was a white bike that said Cartoon Network along the side. And I remember one friend winning one and was like, I don't want this freaking right, bike. Right, right. And then I was like, I'll, I'll t yeah. I bike to work, okay? <laughs> I'll take the bike. So I, everyone, when they see me riding it, are you a showrunner at CN? No, I just got the bike for free <laughs> from a friend who did not want the showrunner bike. I didn't know that. That no. was after. Our yeah, we didn't get, we got pinatas. That's yeah. not nearly as good. <laughs> um, but yeah, do you have any any last words to say to um, the audience that we haven't already talked about? Any, any last wishes, any, you know, harumphs that you want to say? I think like right now, the most important thing as always is be ridiculous. Life is silly and stupid and weird. And every time that we pretend that it isn't, that we sit back and go, no, no, no. Well, this, and then we need to be serious and be everything to everyone and all tourists. It's, it's, it's garbage. Don't do it. Yeah. Be the most ridiculous version of yourself. Be the version of yourself that gets the toy at the bottom of every cereal box. That is what good art is, is being, an idiot with your friends. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I yeah. think uh, uh, that's great. I, I, I think my advice would be- Look at uh, the camera, Jay. Uh, Look right into it. <laughs> Give it my, intense. <laughs> my advice would be to uh, not forget about yourself in your endeavors. Please practice self-care, please. And also maybe motivate yourself more through the aspects of love as opposed to hate. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Yes, both great, both great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, both of you for coming today. Oh. And it's been an amazing chat. Oh. I'm happy that we got to kind of see both sides of the industry, have a little fun. Would you guys like to uh, 
play a game before you go? Oh, f yeah. yeah, let's Hell do this. Yeah. All right, we're gonna do this. <laughs> this is a game where I'm going to pull out three names out of this hat. We are going to decide who we, one, want to become the best friend. Who's gonna support us? Who's the I believe in the you that believes in me and the we? Uh, Who's okay. that character? Second, it's gonna be team up the Batman to your Robin. Okay. And then last, yeah. you guys have seen Tarzan, right? I've heard of it. Yeah. Okay, you remember what happens at the end when he falls yeah. from the tree? <gasps> okay, so who are you befriending? Who are you teaming up with? Who are you defeating? Hanging by a vine. Ready for this first name? Stitch. Second, we have Littlefoot from The Land Before Time, and then we have Inuyasha from the anime, Inuyasha. I'm gonna say befriend first. So one, two, three, Stitch. Stitch. Whoa, wait, we were supposed to do it up. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Do, do not what? listen to the rules, but no, I was thinking, I was lost in these three. Who'd you say for befriend? Who's your friend? I think I would go Stitch. Okay. Yeah, Stitch, go okay. Stitch. Oh yeah, yeah. He's always there for you. He's not a wartime consigliere. You can't do that with <laughs> Oh Stitch. God, I think I know where this is going. Okay, no. Let's go. Yeah, Here's yeah, the yeah. thing. Yeah. Stitch, by definition, is an agent of chaos, right? Exactly. Yeah. He's just gonna cause mischief, and which, in my casual day-to-day, -day, I'm all about. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But, chips on the table, I'm coming down here, I got a street fight, it's sharks first jets. He's not going to be in my choreography. He's yeah, just not I don't swing want that. that. Way. Who do you who do you want to team up? With? Okay. Okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah, ready? Sure. Yeah. One, two, three. Little Yasha. Yasha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be you. Very clear. You that, monsters. That, okay. So this means that you, you monsters. <laughs> no. To my defense. Okay. Listen, listen. Littlefoot is already going to die. We all no. know. Oh, no. <laughs> no. 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 It's not even that. I'm not even going to go that far. All right. Here's the thing about Littlefoot. Littlefoot is insubordinate. He does not <laughs> listen to orders or reason. That is not a teammate. Oh. He's gonna wander off to the other side of the valley For a to go sing a stupid song, all right? He's not gonna give shit about fuck about anything. Yeah. While Inuyasha, on the other hand, Right? How many times? Beefcake how many Central. times was Inuyasha running Kagome to try to save her? I want that person by my side to kill a dinosaur. It is foundation. To kill a, di a baby dinosaur. <laughs> He's gonna go extinct anyway. No, no, that little precious <laughs> embodiment of the progress of the future needs to be saved. I want to focus instead on the pros of Inuyasha. Yes. It is foundational to Inuyasha of partnership, yes. right? And he is used to dealing with disagreeing perspectives. Mm -hmm. That is somebody it is built in for like sportsmanship and teaming up. But also, he has power-ups like Sonic. You give him a Shikon Jewel Shard, He's there. Give him a jewel a shard, Jay. Why don't we get that jewel shard and give it to the goddamn <laughs> Bronto, baby Bronto? No, because anyone else becomes evil. Look into my eyes. <laughs> you think Littlefoot would succumb to evil after saving his friends from goddamn T-Rexes? He has a point. I believe <laughs> Littlefoot is, he cannot be corrupted. And for that, <laughs> he has to die. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for playing this game. I'm gonna stick with my answer. I'm gonna befriend Stitch. I'm going to then team up with Inuyasha to kill Littlefoot. Good luck so... though, You're not, he's not gonna go down easy. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. Spent on being